I have a confession to make. It's true that uh, I was voted as one of the most, most intelligent people in New York. However, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> so how authoritative could that list be? So today, we will be talking about the impossible. When you talk to a doctor and you say that a disease is incurable, it's a challenge. When you talk to a physicist, and you say something is impossible, like invisibility, force fields, time machines, warp drive, that's a challenge. So we are going to talk about the future. It's always dangerous to predict the future. I quote from that great philosopher of the Western world, the great baseball player Yogi Berra. He once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> but I'm a physicist. We invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We created the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. We created x-rays, television, radio, microwaves, MRI. Almost all the wonders you see around you were invented by a physicist. However, sometimes our predictions don't come true. When we helped to invent the internet, one physicist made a prediction that his brainchild would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait till the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> so before I begin a discussion of the fantastic world of Harry Potter, the world of Star Trek, the world of the Terminator, the world of the X-Men. Let me begin with a cautionary story about the impossible. Over 200 years ago, we had the great French Revolution. And one day, there were three gentlemen about to lose their head to the guillotine. There was a priest, there was a barrister, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, about to have our heads chopped off. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words before we cut your head off? And he said, yes. He said, God, God from above shall set me free. Well, the mob said, impossible, impossible. They've seen hundreds of heads fall off. Nowhere did the hand of God stop the blade. Well, all eyes were on the blade. The blade rose. The blade fell and swoosh, and it stopped right before it hit the neck of the priest. Well, the mob had never seen this before. So the mob said, the impossible has happened. By the grace of God, let the priest go. And now let's see about the barrister. Yes, they put his head in the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, maybe the spirit of justice, justice shall set me free. Impossible, said the mob. Well, they raised the blade. It came down, swoosh, and it stopped right before he hit the neck of the barrister. Well, this time the crowd went crazy. People were dancing in the streets of Paris. God has spoken today, they said. Justice has spoken. And now let's see about the theoretical physicist. <laughs> well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words before we lop your physics head off? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got us some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God, and I know even less about the law, but I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is caught on the pulley. <laughs> and then he said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. The rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And the moral of the story is, sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> Nonetheless, let us take a look at the history of the impossible. A hundred years ago, during the end of the Victorian era, this was the greatest British physicist, Lord Kelvin. Lauded by society, people were always in search of a quote and a prediction by the greatest Victorian physicist of his era. He made a series of predictions. Every single one was wrong. 
He said, airplanes, bah, humbug, heavier than aircraft, he said, violate the laws of aerodynamics. X-rays, ha, he said, x-rays are obviously a hoax, there's no such thing as x-rays. Radio, yes, radio exists, but it has no use, no possible use for radio, maybe to communicate to, to ocean liners, but other than that, no use for radio. And the Earth was impossibly young, only a few million years old. Why were all these predictions wrong? It's because Lord Kelvin had the misfortune of living just before Albert Einstein and the birth of the quantum theory. Everything changed when Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr introduced two revolutionary new forms of physics. <clears throat> Even the New York Times got it wrong. This is Robert Goddard, father of American rocketry. The New York Times denounced him in a major editorial, saying he's wasting taxpayers' money because rockets cannot move in outer space, said the New York Times, because there's no air to push against. Well, you don't need air to push against to make rockets move. They, they move because of Newton's third law of motion, action, reaction. The only hot air we now know was in the editorial office of the New York Times. So, I like to quote from Arthur C. Clarke's Three Laws of Impossibility. The third law is my favorite. I think about it almost every day. The third law of impossibility says, quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about magic. Things that, <clears throat> things that come from mythology science fiction, and are now entering the laws of physics. First of all, when you see Star Trek, or you see uh, the Terminator, or you see angels and demons talking about antimatter bombs, realize that most of what you see on this silver screen is possible. These are called class one impossibilities, I say. Possible in the coming years, decades, maybe 100 years at the outset. Telepathy, robots, antimatter bombs, forms of teleportation, invisibility, all within the laws of physics, very soon you will see objects literally disappear because we can already do that on a small scale. Class two requires many centuries of work, but also are possible, for example, time travel, and perhaps even warp drive to the stars. Class three impossibilities are simply downright impossible. For example, perpetual motion machines, getting something for nothing. Every year, some inventor swindles Wall Street, convince millions of investors to invest in their perpetual motion machine. So the Wall Street Journal wants a quote from me, so I give them a quote. I quote from that other great philosopher of the Western world, P.T. Barnum. He once said, quote, there's a sucker born every minute. <laughs> So let's talk about invisibility. First of all, the Greeks were fascinated by invisibility. Plato, Plato even writes at length about invisibility. Plato said that any man with a ring of invisibility would be tempted to kill the king and become the next king. Therefore, said Plato, the temptation of invisibility is so great, you cannot trust man to govern himself. You must have laws. You must have a stable government because the temptation of invisibility is simply too great. However, now we can do it. This year at the University of California, Berkeley, we made visible light, visible light on a tiny scale, bend exactly this way. So we're now making huge inroads on invisibility. Within a few decades, we may even have a working model of an invisibility cloak. Now, there are problems. Let's be blunt about this. If you are inside the invisibility cloak, you cannot look outside. You have to drill two holes. So from the outside, you see Harry Potter's two eyeballs floating in midair. So there are some problems that still have to be solved. But the basic principle of invisibility has been demonstrated. Many of my friends now are jumping into this game. It's one of the hottest fields now in physics. So we went from Greek mythology to fact. And this is how it's done. These are new materials called metamaterials, and this is what they do. You know that if you put a boulder in a river, water wraps around the boulder, reforms at the other end, so downstream you're not aware that there's a boulder upstream. That's how it works. 
Light, we once said, cannot do this until recently. At Imperial College here in London and Duke University, they did it. So this is now done. We now have to enlarge it from, to a small microscopic scale to a large scale, but that's a technical engineering problem. Now let's go to something called teleportation. Wouldn't it be great to simply zap your molecules across the room? Well, believe it or not, we actually have teleported individual atoms and photons using this device. The world's record is 600 meters right across the Danube River. That's how far we have teleported a particle of light called a photon. So every time I watch Star Trek, I smile when Captain Kirk says, fire the photon torpedoes. A photon torpedo is a flashlight. <laughs> so teleportation of atoms, cesium, rubidium, and ytterbium have been done. So maybe in a few years, the first molecule will be teleported. But then you begin to wonder, well, what about organic matter? What about a gene, a virus, a cell? That may take longer. A human will take, of course, even longer than that to teleport a human. But these are engineering problems. But it raises a question. You have to die in order to be teleported. So you see Captain Kirk dissolve, and there's a new Captain Kirk over there who insists that he's the real Captain Kirk. So you begin to wonder, what happened to the soul? If you just died and went to heaven, then who's that person over there if he has all your memories and all your personality quirks? It makes you wonder. Now let's say a few things about Death Stars. People like the movie Star Wars, but the critics said, ha, a laser beam that can blow up a planet? Give me a break. Actually, it is possible to do this. I know this because I was once offered a job designing hydrogen warheads. Let me explain. When I was a child, I was fascinated by the laws of physics. I saw the old Flash Gordon series on television, and I was hooked. Starships, ray guns, aliens from space, that's for me. So when I was around 17 years of age, I decided to be part of this great revolution. I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? <laughs> a 2.3 million electron volt betatron electron accelerator, to be precise. My mom stared at me and said, sure, <laughs> why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> well, I went to Westinghouse. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and we wound it on the football field, 22 miles of copper wire. The magnetic field was 10,000 gauss. That is enough to pull the fillings out of your teeth if you got too close to my machine. Finally, it was ready. It consumed six kilowatts of power, enough to kill you. I closed my eyes, I plugged my ears, I plugged it in, I heard this crackling sound as six kilowatts of power emerged from my capacitor bank, and then I heard this pop, 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 pop sound as I blew out every single fuse in the house. <laughs> the whole house was plunged in darkness. And my poor mom, you know, she had a hard life. She comes home from work, the lights flicker and die, and she says, okay, where's the fuse box? And I imagined her saying, why couldn't I have a son who plays football? Maybe if I buy him a basketball. And why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? I mean, what's wrong with him? He builds these things. Well, because of that, I earned the attention of Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. He actually got me a scholarship to Harvard to finance my my budding career, and he offered me a job designing hydrogen warheads. I said no. However, one thing I learned is that you, there's no limit to the amount of energy you can put on a beam, including naturally occurring Death Stars. This is a gamma ray burster. It is the largest source of energy in the universe. It could fry beams, uh, along these beams of the North Pole and the South Pole, it can fry a solar system from thousands of light years. Well, believe it or not, one of them is pointed right at us. The North Pole of WR-104, shown right here, is pointed right at us. We're staring at the gun barrel of a gamma ray burster about to take place. This is what the Hubble Space Telescope tells us about WR-104, pointed at us. You're staring down the gun barrel of a potentially unstable star 
It will supernova, release the burst of energy. It is 8,000 light years away. Meaning that 8,000 years ago, maybe it already blew up. And you're doing your laundry tomorrow. You look up in the sky, and the sky's on fire. Well, could that happen? The answer is yes. But most astronomers, I think, believe it'll be a dud. We know very little about gamma ray bursters. All we know is that here's one pointed our way. We're monitoring it very carefully. But again, most astronomers think that it may be a dud, in which case the energy won't reach us 8,000 light years away. Now let's just say a few things about telepathy. Wouldn't you like to read somebody's thoughts, find out what they're thinking, or move objects by sheer thought? That's the power of a god, to be able to have mind over matter. Well, we can do it, in a sense. This gentleman here on the lower left had a stroke. He is paralyzed. On the lower left, you see an electrode, a red, red electrode, that is placed in the dead part of his brain, hooked up via an electrode to a laptop. By looking at the laptop, he can move the cursor on the screen, and he can now, even though he's totally paralyzed, he can now do crossword puzzles, surf the web, read emails, and answer emails, even though he is paralyzed. In the future, that thing on top of his brain will be reduced to microscopic scale, and in the future, even normal people may be able to surf the web just by thinking about it, by having an electrode attached directly to the brain. And not only that, but we can even read thoughts to a degree. When you tell the truth, a part of your brain lights up. However, when you tell a lie, whoa, when you tell a lie, first you have to know the, the lie, you have to know the truth, you have to know the cover-up, you have to know the consequences of the cover-up, and the consistency of the cover-up with all the other lies you've been telling all these years. That takes a lot of energy. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. So with 95% accuracy, we can now tell whether you're lying or not. Also, if you take a look at the upper right, we can identify the patterns of what you're looking at. A cat, a dog, a house they register certain patterns. So a dictionary of thought is something that we are now creating. It only has about 20, 30 words in it right now. Eventually, this dictionary of thought may have hundreds, thousands of words. And computer technology is so great now that this, we think, is the future of the internet. This is how you will surf the web via your contact lenses. In your contact lenses, you will have full-blown internet capability, you'll be able to download any video, teleconference at work. This is the future of your home office and the future of your home entertainment center. This chip will also recognize people's faces. So next time you bump into somebody at a conference like this and you say to yourself, I know this person. Who is this person? Jim, John, Jake, who is this person? In the future, your contact lenses will say, it's Jim, stupid, remember? You saw him last year at the last conference. You want to see his entire biography? Or if you're looking for a job and you're at a cocktail party and you don't know who to talk to, in the future you'll know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> Plus the fact that these things are so small we can actually put them in aspirin pills now. Believe it or not, an aspirin pill with the power of a PC with a TV camera inside. I actually have a photograph of this. You swallow it, it photographs all your insides and diagnoses any illnesses you may have. This gives new meaning for the expression, Intel inside. <laughs> also, these things are now being placed in toys, making them intelligent, thus creating a contradiction in terms for the English language, a problem for the English language called smart Barbie dolls. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. <laughs> that is also a contradiction in terms. Moving on, because I want to wind up, even starships, we physicists believe might be possible. Here is a solar sail, one of the devices which may take us to a nearby star, a gigantic sail that unfurls. And this is from the movie 2001. How many people here have seen the movie 2001? Raise your hand. How many people have understood that movie? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, let me tell you what 2001 is all about. It turns out that there are so many planets in the galaxy that it's silly for Captain Kirk to visit each one. How does a virus colonize your body? 
A virus colonizes your body by landing on a cell, hijacking the cell, making copies of itself, thousands of copies. They land on other cells, make thousands more. So it exponentially explodes the number of viruses. And in two weeks, you're sneezing and coughing. That probe is a virus. It lands on a moon, multiplies on the moon, and then these land on other moons to create more viruses and exponentially explodes. Believe it or not, this is the most efficient way to colonize the galaxy, which means that on our moon, perhaps there is a leftover probe from a passing type three civilization that perhaps is just waiting for us to make contact. Now, my friends also search for intelligent life in outer space. They actively look for intelligent life in outer space, and they tell me the, the following. Well, first of all, how come they don't visit us? Well, realize that the Earth radiates radio. We radiate television. There is a sphere surrounding the Earth. It is 50 light years in radius, expanding at the speed of television, containing the finest of our cultural TV archives, <laughs> the noblest achievements of the human creative spirit, like I Love Lucy, and now joined by the immortal classics Beavis and Butthead Part 2, and Dumb and Dumber Part 2, and any star within 50 light years of the Earth will pick up our cultural emissions and they'll be convinced there is no intelligent life on the Earth. <laughs> so let me now wind up. Um, a few years ago, I had the rare pleasure of speaking at the Einstein Centennial. Einstein, of course, talked about the potential of time travel. He investigated antimatter, stuff that we see in the science fiction movies. But when Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and he said, Professor, I've heard your talk so many times, I've memorized it. I'm a part-time actor. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache and a wig. I will be the great Einstein, and you can be my chauffeur and take a rest. Well, Einstein loved that idea, taking a rest, so they switched places. And so the chauffeur gave many, many brilliant talks that he memorized. But one day, in the back, a mathematician asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here will answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. And we'll take questions. <laughs>